So I'm going to show um, uh, a preview of, of V5. I don't think I'm going to be able to show this stuff on my phone, unfortunately. I can't get my phone to reflect onto this. I think there's something weird going on with the projector. But I'll run through uh, V5, and then I'll go through the, um, the demo of the, the live streaming workflow as well. And then um, last thing I'll do is I'll go through um, the roadmap, reviewing the roadmap from last time out and <coughs> looking at what we're going to be doing into the future. And then we'll pause for questions um, after each thing. So uh, Media was a huge uh, product. It has lots of different things that it does and potentially quite confusing in some respects because there's so many things that it does it's quite hard to articulate exactly what it is or what it does. So one of the things we did from a kind of um, simplicity point of view is we've kind of grouped things together now. So the functionality of the product is grouped into these three areas, library, live and learning, so that at least when I go through all these new features, I've grouped them into those things so you can kind of understand where those things sit. So Library is basically the area of the product that where the product started, the actual kind of YouTube type interface that we've got, um, where you can upload the clips and see the categories and all that sort of stuff. Live is this kind of new area where you can do live streaming, live capture um, in terms of capturing a live stream and archiving of a live stream and the, the app as well, which I'll show you. And then learning is our integrations with LMS systems and also coming into that is um, lecture capture as well. So if we start off with the, the library, which we call the medial library now, media library, um, it's a kind of marketing blurb on it. But essentially what we've done, uh, the new version of the library in V4, is we've really smartened up the, the user interface. So this is the new in user interface for uh, v5 it's a completely responsive design so whereas in the past uh, the, the media library has two different interfaces one for a mobile device and one for uh, an iPad or a desktop this one is totally responsive so as you make the say you know you can test this by just getting the browser and making the browser smaller as it becomes smaller instead of having two videos you'd have one instead of having this whole menu system, we kind of like have a, you know, a sort of a, a concertina menu system. It's a totally responsive um, design. It also has a, a light and a dark, um, you know, version of it. So the dark one is more sort of, you know, this grey sort of version is more in our kind of corporate colours. Then the light is something that's more familiar to people that, that have the current uh, media library. Um, I'll drop into actually showing it in a browser in a second, but essentially we've gone from being sort of quite text-based to icon-based in terms of the navigation. Um, but as you roll over these items, it's not that people won't know what these things do, because as you roll over them, there's kind of text to say. So, for example, if they didn't know what a big arrow meant, you know, that means upload, but um, if they didn't know that, they would click on, <coughs> click on it or roll over it and, it and it'll tell them that. So it's kind of designed just to make it look nicer, more appealing, and make it easier to use, and also so that we have a uniform design across all of the different devices, rather than having um, you know, different websites that we have to maintain for different devices. And then the, the player page looks a bit like this. So actually, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me drop into it so you can actually see it in a browser. So this is it here. This image here is obviously one that we've put in, but you would have the ability to, to change this image as well. You can obviously change all the logos and all the other bits and pieces that are there. Um, you can make this image a different size, so if you don't want it to be quite as big as that or quite as tall as that, you can make it uh, different as well. The categories, um, whereas before we'd have the categories kind of here on the left-hand side, we've kind of um, put them in this little menu here and this, this will have a kind of thing to sort of indicate that, that the categories are there, because a lot of people said, oh, they're a bit <laughs> hidden away there. 
but you have the ability to do that. And you also have the, can you see it says categories as we mouse over that, but you also have the ability to have this open by default as well. So if you don't want to hide them away and you want people to have to hide them away, then you can do that. You can swipe through all this different content as well. It's got this sort of little carousel effect here. And as I said, uh, if we get this browser, what's going on with this browser? I was on full screen on this. Oops. For some reason, I can't drag it around. No, okay. As we make it smaller, it would become responsive, but for some reason, this is locked in that, in that position. If we go into uh, some content, you'll see that the, the, the player is much, much bigger. This is using the, the very, very latest um, JW player. Actually, if I go to, we've got the multi-rate stuff, haven't we, on STA1, haven't we? Next up. So if I go here, I'll go through multi-rate in a sec, but you'll see here, as we play this content, we've got this kind of um, multi-bit rate here as well, where it auto goes through the different um, qualities. Um, so this is just playing at, you know, obviously the, the HD one because we've got oodles of, of bandwidth here as well. And this will work uh, on, in terms of the different qualities, uh, as it, uh, Ryan explained earlier, this adaptive bitrate thing where it flips between the qualities based on your connection. Um, this will work on all of your existing content as well. So anything you've got in the library today is already at different rates, but you have to manually switch between them. We have like a little high and low quality button. This will adaptively do it, and it'll do it for all the existing content that you've got. So you won't have to re-upload anything. It'll just work as is, which is, you know, a cool, a cool feature because obviously there's no effort on your side on that at all. Oop. Another thing that I spoke about earlier um, was the fact that now with the library, what we're going to do is that instead of delaying the availability of a clip from when all of the different quality versions are done, we're going to make it available as soon as the highest quality version of the file is available. So for example, if a clip's been uploaded and the HD version of the file's done, which is normally the highest quality version, um, then it'll be available straight away. So you won't have to wait for it to do those three different versions of the file. And then it will prioritize it in terms of always making the highest version of the file of every single file that's in the queue available before it does the lower quality ones. So you should find that there'll be significant gains in terms of availability of content because of that, because it'll only have to do one version of the file before it's made live. Obviously, in the interim of the other versions being available, it won't be an adaptive file um, until the other versions are available. But as soon as the other versions are available, it will be an adaptive uh, bitrate um, media player as well. Can I ask a question? Yeah? Why, why is that way around rather than the other way around? We could do it the other way around. We did, we did talk about that. Um, I think the expectation is now that HD, you know, 720p is kind of fairly ubiquitous now, even on phones and that sort of stuff. The bit rate we do it at isn't prohibi prohibitively high, even on those sort of devices. But I mean, we could flip it roundly. We could do low first. I think we, we had talked about that, didn't we? Make it configurable. Yeah. Would that be your preference then? Because um, uh, I know I was going to get asked. <laughs> right, OK. <laughs> Preempting the question. <laughs> Yeah, we could make it configurable. At the moment, the configuration is really whether you want different versions of files. Yeah. So for example, I know we've got some customers in the Far East that would say, <coughs> I definitely want the low because the internet's not very good. Yeah. Whereas I, I know that I've got customers in the US that would just say, that low version quality of the file is completely useless to me. Yeah. It's not very good. I don't want it. And I've even got some customers that have come to me and said, actually, Rob, if you can just make it so I get the 720p version, I'm happy with that. Take the other two away. Yeah. So we're going to make it configurable. But we hadn't thought about doing that. So we could. Yeah, it's just ordering, isn't it, really? Yeah, it makes it slightly more complicated. But yeah, we can do it. <laughs> um, 
we spoke about this earlier, this kind of, you know, rough sort of uh, figures of how long stuff to takes, to tra takes to transcode. I, I kind of included this slide as a bit of a memory jogger because I was speaking to Dave about this the other day and we were talking about if, for example, you had some screen capture content that had been produced by a bit of software like the Camtasia software or like uh, the Medial Lecture and we could skip the HD version of the file because it's already fine, we're not going to do anything to it, and then we just had to do one other quality, a high, for example, what would that do to this kind of timings thing? How long would it take to do it? And we did it, didn't we, on a sort of base level spec machine, and it took about 15 minutes, 15, 16 minutes, didn't it, for an hour's worth of content? Yes, from 17, memory. Minutes. 17 minutes for an hour's worth of content. So what we're the point is here is what we're trying to do is we're trying to cut down the amount of time for things to become available and dealing with them in order of priority and also to say that if you cut down the amount of stuff that it's doing, the amount of qualities that it's doing and you're settling on, let's say, a HD and a high, you can cut that time down, I mean, by to like 25% or less because it's not having to do so much work. So it's all about trying to think about what the users want and really is there some overhead in there that you don't really need i mean that's something that we can comment on but equally it's something that you know you're saying potentially low quality is very useful some people say to me well actually it's not useful at all because you know we're showing this content everyone's got these great phones everyone's got this or they've got oodles of bandwidth or some people might even say to me to be fair people are only viewing it internally We've got oodles of bandwidth, and we're not even making it externally available. So it's all about what you, who you see as viewing the content, but equally playing it up against the amount of time that, that these systems are taking to transcode the content. So this is a kind of worst-case scenario. All these little things that you can do, you can, you can trim away at that. Um, little enhancements in the library, little things make a difference, as they say. So you can actually edit a clip in terms of the metadata, or delete a clip, actually there in the library. So if I go to the browser, if we go back, and then we just, uh, what do we do? We go little, oh, I'm not logged in, am I? <laughs> Too logged in to do it. Uh, where are we? Hoping I've got the password right. No. So I've heard quite a number of people will ask for this where they're saying, well, I don't really want to go to the back end to kind of edit a clip. I just want to click here, click edit, and then it takes me into a screen where I can just edit the clip straight away and upload a new file or edit the metadata or do whatever. Similarly, if you wanted to delete the content, you could do that there as well, provided you know you've got the rights to do that, of course. So that's another sort of small thing, but you know, makes a difference. As I said, we've got this kind of multi-bit rate uh, thing going on in the player now, so you can, you, you can manually go between the qualities if you want to, but the auto setting is just detecting the amount of bandwidth that you've got available, and it's doing it at the rate that's applicable to the, um, the bandwidth that you have available. So that, that technology is the, the Wowser streaming service technology, and we've now integrated with that so that all of the content that you already have and any new content that you upload, it, it will do that which is, um, you know, just ensures that it's going to play back absolutely everywhere and at the right quality for that device. Another thing that we did in the player was that you can now um, go, uh, uh, not in terms of um, sp uh, playback speed, as in actually, you know, how fast the content plays back. So you could speed this guy's voice up to like two times, what do we go up to, three times, something like that? Two, two, two and a half times, yeah. So this, this is a, it's one of those weird features whereby when this has been suggested to me, I've just thought, why does anybody want that? But um, it, does have a, it does have a use case. Um, I mean, it's come from the States more than anywhere. I've not really heard much about it in the UK, but the use case is here that apparently when these students watch back these videos, and you're going to have to verify this for me, 
is that the watching it back with the voice um, at regular speed isn't fast enough for them. They want to listen to it like it's a chipmunk. So they'll play it back at double speed. They're still um, getting that information and they're still uh, assimilating it, but an hour long video is only gonna take half an hour to watch at the end of the day and then they can get on Facebook or do whatever else they do. So that is, that's the kind of the application and they can do that. So this here sort of, dovetails into something else that we've got on our roadmap whereby uh, with analytics in the future I'll show what we're going to be doing with analytics but in the future you'll be able to tell like video engagement the percentage of the video that's been watched who buy at what time etc this will sort of it will be difficult with this because they still technically will have watched the whole video but they'll have done it in half the amount of time but you know, from our perspective, they'll still watch the video. So this in the US, yeah, this is like a big requirement. We get asked for this all the time, and they basically say, yeah, because of that, they want to be able to watch the video at double speed in terms of the audio. I can't stand to watch a video like that personally. I, I find it really irritating, but, you know, that's... that's this can be helpful for finding useful content. Yeah, yeah, potentially, yeah. If it's, if it's, if it's a long lecture and they want to focus on the bits and they want to spend a little while, yeah. Yeah, it's tricky to find. Yeah. 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 So it's in there, so they can um, they can change the speed of the playback. The branding of the library itself. So we've made it now so that it's you know you can you can pick colours, you can centre things, you can kind of see your image there previewed. There's a lot more that you, that you can do that you couldn't do before in terms of customising the library and making it look, you know, nice. Um, and, you know, we, we hope that you think it, it looks a lot nicer. Chapters, um, we've always had chapters in the product, but now we have this uh, differentiation between public and private chapters. Before, um, we had some discussion around chapters and we kind of realised that all the chapters were, were public really as you were creating them. I mean the videos weren't all public but if you had a video that you could see, you could see all the chapters that anyone had created. Now you can kind of create these private chapters so that not everyone can see them and they appear in a much more kind of elegant way. And in the player uh, itself, if I go back to STA, it's much easier to kind of create the chapters. So if we go, have I got to be logged in to do this? Oh no, I've got to go to chapters, haven't I? Yeah, I've got to be, well, I don't think I logged in. Good job I've got Lee here at the front to answer all these questions. <laughs> there we go. So when you play this, what was it? Spacebar or something Is it to create a chapter? Um, It isn't spacebar, no. Okay, control C. No, we can't remember the keystroke. There is a keystroke that you can. Pr yeah. What am I doing? Oh, add start chapter. Okay, there we go. End chapter. There we go. So you can do it all there within the player. There is a keystroke as well, but we've we've forgotten it, so we apologise for that. So that's adding chapters within the player. So it's quite easy as you go through the content, you can, you can add these chapters, which is quite cool. And then you can add you know, metadata or whatever and choose whether you want it public or private. It's Ollie, who's not here today, but he, he has been every other year, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're all, yeah, they're all independent pieces of content as well. Yeah. So this one here is why we chose Medial. And you can embed these as well if you want. We have had some issues recently, haven't we, getting them to work on iOS, but we're... Yeah, seeking on iOS. Seeking on iOS is, is quite tricky with that, but trying to get that to work properly at the moment. Okay. Back to the slides. 
So moving on to kind of more technical stuff about the library, as Ryan suggested earlier, um, and I talked about as well earlier, flash and, you know, funerals and coffins and all that sort of imagery is what everyone seems to talk about now. It's kind of, it's, it's dying and it's, it's going. So we've kind of defaulted to HTML5 now because, you know, Flash really isn't, isn't there anymore. The reason for, for doing that is that there's, there's two elements to, to content in our library. There's live and, uh, and VOD. And if you look at, this is just a slide from uh, JW Player's uh, website. If you look at the support now for Flash as opposed to video tag, which is just HTML5, the support for the video tag is across the board at the end of the day, whereas the support for Flash is just dying off. I mean, look, Chrome for Android, Safari for iOS, and actually, I think uh, Chrome for desktop is, is going to go soon as well. So that's gradually dying off, and that is gradually um, becoming, well, I mean, it's there. It's there already, isn't it? And then on the live side for the browsers, it's a, it's a trickier picture, really, with live. You've got kind of different types of live streaming. You know, we're talking about basic live streaming, the, the stuff that's in V4 now at single rate. Then you've got adaptive rate, the stuff that we're going to be in V5. Then you've got all this other kind of more complicated stuff that I'm not going to go into the details of today, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Realistically, most people will go down the route of the first two columns. If you're looking at that, the support's fairly patchy there because you know Chrome, from the stats that I've read recently, Chrome is by far the most popular browser now, and it's not even supporting you know, this kind of basic HTTP live streaming, so you're having to do it in Flash for Chrome. From the point of view of what you need to know to do with Medial, we are essentially making sure that it'll work on these devices. So the latest work that we're doing now is to try and detect the user agent of the browser and then render the player based on the browser that's coming in. So we're sort of detecting which one of these browsers is being used and we're deciding whether we do it in Flash or HTML5 or HLS um, based on the browser. And that's for live streaming. For, for regular just video on demand streaming that isn't live, we're essentially saying default to HTML5 because there's no point in using Flash anymore unless you're particularly attached to it, which I doubt. Sure. Um, we've got other user bases from, obviously from all over the world. So in certain parts of, of the world, you know, they're still being internet to our phone. Yeah. Um, will media still work in places where Flash will still be used? Yeah, so we've got a, we have a primary player, which will be HTML5, but it, it can fall back to Flash if required. I mean, if they're still using... Are you talking about China, presumably, using IE7? Or, Africa, yeah. You know, yeah. It's getting a bit out of date now. Uh, so I think some, quite a few, some technology is going to be a problem with... Well, uh, uh, well there is, there is a, we didn't see it in the room. <laughs> 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 We need the boom mic again. We did have a boom mic one, yeah. Uh -huh, hello. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've even seen with uh, Media Central our, ourselves, um, and we've only had it for a few, for what, six months? Six mm -hmm. months. Um, there is a, a, a difference between, um, say, Western, say, if you want to call it first world societies, who will have smartphones and will yeah, have yeah. Um, the, the type of tech that they're using and the type of tech that developing countries might be using is yeah, very different. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have to kind of serve, obviously, all of that estate. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm finding sometimes um, we've got installs where we've, we, you know, we've got desktops which still will have flash on, and that might not change for a while. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, yeah. we can still support it. All that we're saying is it's pri prim primary in okay. our player is going to be HTML5, just purely because that's the way it's gone. But if people still got Flash, they can still use it. But it's going to become increasingly difficult for them to do that, I would say. It's just, I mean, security. There's so many security yeah, flaws. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying anything that's I'm going to get sued for. It's just in the IT press all the time. Flash, it's all these security flaws with it. And whether Adobe are that interested in patching it, I don't know, mm. really. It doesn't, doesn't appear so. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just think that a lot. Some people just don't update. That's why I know. <laughs> <laughs> True. Okay. So yeah, I mean, Flash. I see it as a kind of a bit of a relic in terms of video on demand streaming. For the live streaming side, it is still there. This, you know, most of these encoders spit out RTMP, so it is it is still around. But gradually, I think that will get phased out. Gradually, the browsers will just start saying, no, I'm not going to do it. But as Ryan kind of said earlier, the latency with something like uh, with the iOS devices, which is just using HLS, is, is not good. So that's one of the interests that we have in their player, in that we could get the latency right down for iOS. Because it is a bugbear. You, know, you, you do streaming of a live event, and all the support stuff that you'll get to do with it will be, it's not working. It's like, did you leave it running for a minute? Oh yeah, it's working now. And it, there's nothing we can do about that. That's just an inherent flaw of the technology. So yeah, it, it will get there. Another thing in V5 was um, if you're an admin now, you don't kind of inherit the upload limits that are, con uh, that are um, for the library itself. You, you can kind of bypass that just by being a, an admin. It's a minor thing. So those are all the things that are in the library. There's quite a lot of stuff there. And it's quite, it's quite I think it's going to be quite a big transition in terms of the, the regular users of the system that it looks quite different. So you know, I know when we first showed the new user interface was our user group in Scotland. And there was a few people. I mean, I wasn't there, so I didn't see people's faces or the whites of their eyes. But I remember the um, questions were a bit around, oh, right, and this is, you know, can it do this? Can it do that? Can you do this? So we made quite a few changes as a, as a result of that feedback, because there were quite a few people that were saying, well, it's quite radically different. People might be a little bit sort of freaked out by that. So we've made refinements to it off the back of that, because it is very, very different. But it needed to be done, really, because the current user interface is um, is definitely you know behind the curve in terms of the way things have gone. So uh, live, so this is sort of a, a new area for most of the people here because most of the people haven't done live streaming through Medial. So the first thing to say is about the Medial Live app. I was speaking to somebody in the break and they said, oh, I've searched for it and I couldn't find it on the App Store. It's Medial Live, all one word. If you search for that, you will find it on the um, Google Play Store and the uh, Apple uh, whatever it's called, App Store. If you search for on that, you'll, you'll get that. So I can't show it on my phone because for some reason my phone's not letting me reflect from my phone to my PC. But this is the way it looks. You've got, um, you know, it's whatever the video is on your, on your phone, you get to switch between uh, the bit rate, the quality that you're going to do it at, and you've got a big red button that you can press to, to stream to the, the server. And then you know, you've got this sort of splash screen that shows you all the, the configuration options. When I do the demo of the live streaming, the thing to say here is that you know, some people look at that and say, there's a big red button like that. That's a good check. But how do I actually use it? How do I get it streaming live to Medial? In V5, um, it might actually be the next slide. No, it's not. Where are we? No. OK, it's a, it's a few slides on. But in V5, there's a, an option for the user to go in and press on a button which emails them a link. And when you click on that link, it populates all of the information needed to do a live stream into this app so that you just need to click on the big red button to stream live. That's it. So it's just one click, and then it sends you an email to your phone, and you have to click on the link in the email, and then it'll do all of that for you. So you don't need to be going into the app and configuring it and typing in a server address and this, that, and the other, and a username and password. You don't need to do any of that. It will just um, email you the link that you need to click on. So the idea here is in V5 is to, to let uh, potentially anyone do a live stream. It's not just an admin function. In V4, only administrators can set up live streams. In V5, if you want them to, any user could do a live stream if you wanted them to. And they could download this app, and this app's completely free, no cost to it at all, and they could start doing some live streams on their phone or on probably more likely on their iPad, to be fair, because on the phone it's you know slightly, you know, it's quite small. 
But yeah, you could do it on the phone or the iPad or on any of the Android devices as well. So the Medial Live workflow I'll show in the next presentation, but it's, it's a kind of, you know, uh, a complete workflow for live. There's loads of different things that you can configure in it, but I'm not going to kind of steal my own thunder for, the, for that part of the presentation. We also, what we've done with it, we've kind of shipped with it um, some kind of royalty-free pre- and post-roll clips. So a clip that you can show before your live stream goes on and a clip that you can show after your live stream goes on. Because what most people, when we were showing this to them, they were kind of saying, oh, well, I'm going to have to create that clip and oh, I, I can't do that or I'll have to pay Adobe or Getty or somebody for the video. So we kind of quickly came to the conclusion that, you know, we could stick Powered by Medial on it so we could get what we wanted. And we could also give people these really nice videos that, that play and they've got, you know, lots of lovely images of students coming out of universities and in lecture theatres and all that sort of stuff. So you get those with it. So if you want to create this really nice live stream that's got a lovely pre-roll video, lovely post-roll video and it all looks nice, then we're going to sh we ship those videos with the software so that you can just have those and use those. So you can create a really cool professional experience for your live stream. Can I ask a yep. If you're doing a live stream, um, so you've, you've got a team somewhere live streaming an event. Yeah. Is that using the same transcoder as stuff which get, which is getting uploaded to be put into the library? So are there any issues with, in the middle of a live stream, some a queue happening and starting to interfere with that transcoding? The transcoding, you were saying, of the... I mean, if you're, if you're actually streaming and then somebody uploads something completely separately, does that transcoder sort of, does it default to no. the live stream or is there any issues there? So it's kind of two different elements you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. The first one is just playing back the live stream. So when you're point, so you're pointing from your encoder to medial, there could be other people uploading uh, clips at the same time. One thing doesn't really affect the other because one of the things is just streaming out a live stream. The other one is actually doing transcoding of live streams as they go. We are archiving that live stream as well. So there is some transcoding going on, but it's not that processor Sorry, intensive. Archive. When you're creating a, a VOD version of the live stream, there is some transcoding going on, on on the medial server to do that. And there is also transcoding going on on that queue. But that live stream, when it's transcoding on the fly, it doesn't appear in the queue. It's just, it's just going it's on on the server. Yeah. Okay. At the end of it, once it's totally finished, the live event, then that clip will go into the queue to be transcoded. The point to make here is, and this is probably more part of the next presentation, that once you start doing that live stream at multiple rates, mm. like not just one rate, single rate, you're doing it at 720p, 480p, 160p, let's say, that then starts to become really processor intensive. That, that is the point at which you kind of go, right, we shouldn't really be doing this live streaming on the same server as Medial. So our recommendation is going to be, when we release this, that if you're doing single rate live streams, you're not going to do them at all these different rates so that it'll go between them. We're going to say we're pretty comfortable with people doing that on the same server as, as Medial, provided, you know, you know, you've seen my kind of thing with the hours of content, number of transcoders you need. If it's multi-rate, we're actually going to suggest to buy another Wowser server to do it because it's very processor intensive and we would just suggest you should just get a, another Wowser server to do that task on its own. Would you ever do something like, I mean, for the moment we use Wirecast, yeah. which just uses the laptop that we're using on site yeah. and then that's sending those streams. I mean, that comes up to about 97% of the CPU yeah. if we were doing three streams. Right. Um, but potentially you could run it I mean, could you use your laptop there as your, as, your trans, as your server, as your transcoder? Would it have to be something set up on site? You can use Wirecast, it's not a problem. To, you could send to, from Wirecast Oh, yeah, to yeah, well. yeah. I mean, this is any encoder. I'm just okay. using the example of this yeah. as a simple example. But actually, within the software, there's another button you can press to send it to Wirecast if you want. Like, yeah. the, the, um, the little uh, Wirecast uses an XML file, I think, mm. from memory, that you feed into it. And then there's also another one, um, what's the other one that we do? 
Firecaster and NewTek, isn't it? The TriCaster. So the NewTek TriCaster has a different method of doing it, and we send the file for that to the end user as well if they wanted to do that. What you're doing on, the, on that box, whatever that PC is, is you're just pushing the live stream out. The transcoding you might be doing, I don't know a particular bit of software, but sometimes what it'll do, like this one that we're using here, is saving the file locally to the, to the actual machine, and then we would upload that file later to Medial, let's say. It's, it's a tricky question to answer because there's so many different ways of doing it, but the differentiation here is that if it's single rate, basically what the server's doing is it's taking that stream in and it's just passing it through. There's not much going on. So we're pretty comfortable saying, do your live streaming from the same server. Don't worry about it. As soon as you're taking in that live stream and then you're going, right, I want to take that one and I want to do it at this rate, at this rate, at this rate, at this rate, that then starts to use a lot of the CPU of the server. So we're kind of getting to the point now in the testing we're doing is saying, actually, hang on a minute. If you want to do this multi-rate stuff, separate that off as a separate task, separate WoWs a server, and then that WoWs a server will feed that content into Medial as a VOD file, and it just go into the queue, effectively. Mm -hmm. But we have even seen some of the stuff I've been doing with Lee recently about live streaming. We have even seen as those files are coming in, and they're being what WoWs terms as transrated, um, they're just creating a VOD file as it goes. So we could actually just use that file and not even transcode it afterwards. We'd have to tweak it a little bit. We've sort of seen that there's some inconsistencies between what that file is and what we need. But we're, we're thinking of actually just doing that with it now because we saw it. It was by mistake, actually, that we started running these live streams at all the different rates. And then we would stop the live stream and then our medial transcoder would actually archive the same live stream five times because it was seeing these five files coming in. And it didn't know that they're the same thing. It just was, it was doing it. So we thought, oh, hang on. There's these five different things. We'll just use those as the different qualities. So there's, there's loads of different ways of doing it, but it is multi-rate live streaming, very CPU intensive. So we, we definitely can separate that off. And a very related question. When you mentioned the... Um that you could allow other people to live stream as well. Yeah. Is there any danger of them getting in each other's way? So if somebody's all, is it just using one channel or can, you know, could, could we be ready to do an event and somebody decides to, you know, sort of really short of their power at <laughs> swearing or something. Yeah. And that stops us getting online. Each live stream has its own unique name. Mm. If somebody was streaming exactly the same live stream as somebody else, one would take over the other, because we tried it, because we thought, well, what would happen? Um, but realistically, I mean, they're nine digits long, you know, they're hard, they're very hard to guess. Everyone would have their own unique one. You're not gonna get one taking over from the other unless they absolutely know what each other's live streams are. And even then, we could probably build something in that would stop it from doing that. We, we haven't currently. Um, but yeah, if, again, if it's passing it through, you can stick a load of live streams in to Wowzer and it will deal with it. But if you've got, let's say, 10 people live streaming and they're all expecting it to be at all these different bit rates, yeah, you're kind of, you're kind of asking for trouble, I would say. So yeah, single rate, fine. Otherwise, yeah, okay. <laughs> CPU is Limit required. Access, yeah. yeah. <laughs> On a single rate from how a. Many how many users could be served the live stream from a single Wowser server? Not only served, how many people could broadcast? Wouldn't that be crazy? It's, mm, it's more of a question for Ryan, I would say. I mean, they do have the stats on that. It's a Wowser performance thing. They always say to me on the performance side, going outbound, which is what this is, because you're coming in as a source and you're passing it through outbound, it's more limited by the internet pipe than anything else. If you were translating it, then, I mean, there is, there's a document, um, have I still got it up on my browser? I was looking at this the other day. Uh, here we go. This document here talks about transcoder benchmarks for transrating a 720p file on different servers. So this, this will basically tell you the CPU usage of all of the different things. So if you were doing 
6 at 720p at all these different rates. It would tell you the CPU usage on lots of different servers. So you'd get an idea from this document. I'm happy to kind of share, well, the URL is going to be in the video, but you can, you can have a look at that. That's quite a good thing to look at. But, you know, when I sort of see these type of numbers creeping in, when it's like 66%, 59%, it's not, it's not something that appeals to me that using that much CPU on a server. So I have question. The, uh, this slide just illustrates really that there's a unique playback page URL. So within Medial, you can view the live streams. Um, but that will have all of the stuff around it and underneath it that you would have on a regular Medial playback page. We've also created just a, a playback page that just has the basics on it. Because when you go to all these live streaming services, what they generally have is just a player on a page. We've got that that you can brand, you can totally stick your logo on it, you can have a message bar, you can click these kind of icons so that people can download stuff after the event and you can put a message up there as well. So that's completely customizable as well, that live playback page. Does multi-rate as well, as we discussed, with a caveat that that is very CPU intensive and it's using the very latest um, JW player as well. This is kind of how it looks from a default perspective. So as you uh, set up your live streams, let's say we'll do the example, your example, you're saying, I don't mind people live streaming, but I don't really want them to do it all these different qualities. Your default setup could be that I, only, I want you to do it at 720p, and actually I only want to ever make available 720p or the source stream, that's it. And you could turn off all the other ones. So that any live streaming that was done as a default, they would only get it at that rate. So that's the default for, for a live stream. But then you can go in and, and set up a, you know, what is my source, re what is my resolution of my live stream? Set that. And then you could set on an individual live stream basis, you could override what the defaults are as well and set up, you know, different rates as well. As Ryan mentioned as well, you'll see the option there to push to the Wowzer Streaming Cloud. So he showed, you know, a fairly brief demo of the Wowzer Streaming Cloud. It's just the service that if you were doing a live event, you were thinking we're going to get thousands upon thousands of people watching this and we really need to push it to a content delivery network. We can push directly to the Wowzer Streaming Cloud. You'd have to have an account set up on the Wowzer Streaming Cloud, but we can do that. So you just check that button. Yep. Just uh, can you go back to the... Oh, sorry. Thank you. Do you mind just going back? Um, with the kind of uh, defaults, like is archived and is featured, is that only available to the administrators or is that going to be available to the end users? That's an end user screen, isn't it, Lee? Yeah. It's yeah. kind of specific to the... Uh, um, to the stream. Yeah, to the, uh, my yeah, the is featured probably shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, Good thank point. you. <laughs> Yeah, the is featured should probably be stripped out of the end user, actually, thinking about it. Here you go, development on the fly here. <laughs> but is archived, I think it's fair enough. You'd want it to be archived. And then, as I said here, you know, when you come to do your live stream, you select the encoder that you're using. So in this case, Media Live for iOS or the uh, uh, Telestream. Uh, what was it, Wirecast or the uh, new tech one. We've only got those ones in there because those are the only ones we've even asked for so far. Um, but if you're using anything different, then you know, we can put, put it in there. And then you click on the button to email you or download the file. And then in the case of the apps, it just would send you an email and you would click on the link and you would get the live stream up and running on your phone. Or in the case of the other ones, it sends you a little um, text file that you need to upload or, or open in that app. Uh, the other thing that we built in here, and this was something that was kind of limiting quite a few people in the live streaming side of things, was that in order to do a live stream, you had to have a username and password set up on the Wowzer server. And because Wowzer is separate from us in terms of you know, how we set up the authentication, it was becoming you know, a bit of a barrier really to using this because it meant that you know, you've got a user who wants to do a live stream. 
you then as an administrator have to set up a password and a username for them on Wowzer and give them that and too complicated. So we've, we've basically bypassed that now so that as long as there's a, a live stream of the, of the name that the end user is using set up on the server. So for example, Rob is trying to do a live stream. My live stream is called one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight live. And I try and stream it. As long as there's a live stream set up on the system called that and is configured as such by me as my user, then we let it stream. We don't necessarily need a username and password to do the live stream. We just assume that you know that person has configured that live stream and we let it go. Because this part of it was too ungainly. It just it was an extra step that wasn't required. Yep. That's good. Thank you. I know previously beforehand within the live elements you was able to set up a scheduled service. Yep. Are you still able to set up a scheduled service? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna come to it. Don't worry. Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so I'll do that when I do the demo of it. Um, I'll move on to the, the learning part of it. So we've always had uh, Moodle and Blackboard, and we've always kind of alluded to the fact that we had Canvas as well, albeit you know relatively um, low-key um, integration with Canvas. Um, it's something that we've kind of made available in our knowledge base now, and we're going to publicise the fact that we have that now. Does anybody have Canvas here, or is it we're all one? Okay. <laughs> Three hours ago, okay, hot off the press. <laughs> um, anybody else looking at it? Yeah? One, two, okay. So generally the UK is Blackboard or Moodle. There's a few people, I think it's like two that have got a desire to learn. Um, Canvas, a few places, but they've, they've got an office here in London and they, they seem to be kind of, you know, really trying to go after this as a market and it's very big in the US so we've kind of had had to get into supporting Canvas so we, we do have that now so if you are thinking of migrating away or you already have migrated away then you know our integration will still work with that so medial lecture I'll, I'll show this um, as well as doing the slide so this is our screen capture app called medial lecture it's a uh, it's a software application that works on Windows and, uh, and Mac uh, on the desktop. So let me show it to you. So I am logged in. I am. Good. So a user would have to be logged in to, uh, to Medial in some way, shape or form to use this tool. And they would click on the um, record screen icon and it launches the application so this application is is lightweight as in you don't need um, admin rights to install this application and it's kind of a bit probably the best way of talking about it, it's kind of a bit like um, go to meeting if you've ever used that it sort of launches within the browser and it sort of overlays over the browser so the controls that you've got here within this are record the screen, screen and webcam, webcam or, or just uh, your voice. And then uh, other things that are worth noting here. You've got, well, sorry, my webcam's got a little thing over it. There we go. So you've got um, the ability to capture your webcam at uh, 480p or 720p. And then you can decide the resolution that you want to capture at, whether you want to do it at 720p or 1080p. Um, and then you can obviously select the microphone that you're using, et cetera. Library is just kind of, you know, just the recordings that you've kind of uploaded or you've got stacked up ready to upload. And then there's obviously a help section as well. If we go into record, we'll do go the whole nine yards and do everything. You can either select an area of the screen or you can just record the full screen. I'll record my full screen. Uh, the webcam, you can move around and you can resize it. I can't move it because unfortunately it's underneath what I'm looking at there. But So I'm recording now. I've got uh, drawing tools if I want to do those, like you know, stick annotations or whatever over it. You can select different colors, all that sort of stuff that you want to see. 
and then once you click done, saves the file. So all of the time that I'm recording this, it's transcoding it on the fly. So it's creating an MP4 file. Move around and you can resize. So it's creating an MP4 file as I'm doing this. So there won't be any transcoding to be done at the end of this. This, this is already locally created, this MP4 file, that will be the one that will ultimately stream back from uh, Medial. At this stage, I've got my little tools up here. They're not that clear there, but there's trim, as in um, top and tailing the video. There's a chop function, as in taking a small part of the video out of the timeline. And then there's um, titles and credits that you can add to the start and the end of, of the video. So, you know, that's pretty much what an average user would want. They're not going to want much more than that. doesn't have to be because you could just store it in your library and do it if you wanted to, yeah. But I think most, in a general workflow, most people do it after the recording. But yeah, you, you, could, do it, you, could, you could do it retrospectively if you wanted to, yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah, it is true. But this is kind of, it's kind of the conversation that was having in the break in the there's sort of a differentiation here between lecture capture and personal captures. I would term this as, this It's called medial lecture. <laughs> I get that. But lecture capture, this, this is personal capture, I would term it as, more than lecture capture. It could be used in a lecture capture setting. I don't, don't disagree at all. But if you were doing personal capture, you probably would capture it and then edit it a little bit. I mean, probably wouldn't be that much editing. It's like what we're doing today we're starting and stopping that. The post-production on this stuff that we do today will be pff, nothing. I mean, it'll probably take about an hour on Monday morning because we'll just slice a bit off at the start that was, you know, we were said something that we didn't want to say and at the end and that'll be it and we'll just upload it. And, and I think the same is true of something like this in general. Um, so, so, yeah, it, it could be done in that way if you wanted to. Then... You click done, and at this point, you're just adding your um, your metadata. In in a medial setting, I mean, I've logged in as an admin, but in a medial setting, your email address would get uh, put across here, and then you would be able to upload it to whatever category you wanted to. I put it into astrophysics because we want to sound clever, and then that will upload it directly into uh, medial. If we get out of there, and we go into, oh, it hasn't, it hasn't uploaded it yet. Let's have a look. There we go. What is it? Yeah. Oh, has it gone into default? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> There you go, Lee. Category selection isn't wired up quite right there. It's a bug. But in default, there it is. There it is. And playing straight away. So it didn't take, my point being, it didn't take very long for it to get up there, right? And that's, the, that's our video that we recorded. So... That, I would say, you know, the main strengths of it are its usability, because it's very simple to use, and also the fact that if you're looking for something that's highly scalable in terms of what we were talking about, this transcoding queue and all that sort of stuff, well, this isn't going to need to do any transcoding. The, the, the transcoding is going to be done on the client machine, not on the server. We are going to make this so that it doesn't necessarily just do one quality of file. That is one quality. I captured that at 720p, and that is playing back at 720p. We are going to make it so it's configurable, so you could do it at more than one quality, and in that case, it would take longer to get up there. But the initial conversations I've had with people are actually that they prefer the speed over the fact that you could have lots of different qualities. They're almost kind of blown away by the fact that the lecturer could capture it and then it could be there straight away rather than having to wait for it because there's not that many solutions out there that just do that and make it available that quickly because 
the power there that all that transcoding is being done on the, the user's machine, not on the server. So it's taking a lot of load off of the server. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's I would say, its sort of main uh, strength, really. So yeah, so briefly to kind of summarize on that, you've got the tri trimming and the chopping, and it's available for Mac as well. Uh, and then you've got the ability to, um, you know, to do the annotations and all that sort of stuff as well. So, am I correct in assuming that you have to log in to, um, using your uh, credentials? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you do. You've okay. got to log in to use it. Yeah. Thank you. And it captures the screen as well? Yeah. So, you can screen person and the audio? Yeah. So, when I did it, I've just captured the screen was my browser, basically. So, you could cap whatever's going on on your screen, it's going to capture. So, it can I capture just the screen an area of the screen, the whole screen, the screen and your webcam, the screen and your audio, or just the audio. Thanks. So all of those things. You can decide what you want. Is it a full frame rate for that? Sorry? Is it a full frame rate for frames a second? It's a good question. I think... Because your one looked quite, um, you know, like it was a very low frame rate. It's a very good question, and I can tell you, because I... Which would just matter if somebody was doing... Do you know, a full screen of themselves or something like that. <laughs> so I'm going to show you my horrible desktop now. And also another question just came in. Yeah. Um, does it do dual screen? Um, I don't believe it does. You can choose which screen, but I don't think it does dual screen. No. So the frame rate... 10 frames per second on the 720p. Is that your frame rate for the main video and the camera? It's going to be for both, okay. yeah. So you're not the two separate rates? Ah, good question. Let's have a look. I think the, the camera is going to be different, isn't it, from the screen? I'd have to get back to you on that. It's a good question, though. I know that the overall outputted video is at both of those rates is 10 frames per second. Let's do this low capture one. What's that? Yeah, I was interested, so I just kind of had a look at all these files that it was producing before they went up. Is that one fourth? Yeah, so the low capture one is 14 frames per second. And then in terms of configuring the camera, let's have a look. Was there an option to do that? I don't. Th I don't think there was. I think there was just. Um, oh. Which one? Oh, an advance? Is there an advance setting here? I didn't know that. Oh, more. Oh, here we go. Yeah, no, here we go. You're right. So yeah, you can change. Yeah, you could change it to up to what twenty. Yeah. So you can change you can change the frame rate of the camera, but I, you can't change the frame rate of this, of the screen recording. So yeah, I was doing it. I, I can't recall what I went in on there. That one. Was it that one? It must be. What was there? Did you change it? 720. No, it was 720. 720. Oh, so I think it was. Where is the 720? Oh, right at the top. Oh, that one. So I did it at 10, but you could you could change it. You could go up to 20. Would that is that your preference to go higher on the camera then? I would call 30 yeah. minimum on the camera. 30. Because if you're going to be sorry, if you want a talking head, yeah, you're going to be quite juttery after a little while unless you keep perfectly still. Yeah. Yeah, we'd have to ask a question on that one. Okay. I mean, 15 for the desktop would be fine because if you're recording a PowerPoint or something, the frame rate there really doesn't matter. Let me note it down. Yep. Oh, the oh, if you're playing a video. No, it wouldn't. It's just going to capture the mic. Yeah, unless you, unless you uh, were flipping. Well, there's ways and means of doing that, but. 
get there, into there trouble. There you go, that's my answer. <laughs> Don't bother. <laughs> So you're saying 30 for the camera, okay. So you can you could do what you're saying, Andy, but you'd you'd have to you'd have to have a little uh, there is an app to do that called SoundSight and it's for the Mac. And you can flip between your mic and the internal audio and you can do it. Siphon. S I P H O N. I only know this because um, <laughs> some of the webinars that we've done recently, we've recorded them and then we've played them back as live. So all this webinar software, you, if you do it totally live, you choose your microphone and you speak and you show your screen. If you pre-record it, you basically just want to play the video and, and not. So you then have to have... Uh, trick your computer, not trick your computer, but you then have to be able to select the internal audio of your computer on your microphone because you want to play back the recording in a media player and play back that audio to the audience. So it, can, it is possible to do it, but you've got to get these apps to do it. And actually most of those applications are available for people to pirate <laughs> videos because they want to play something in the iPlayer and record the, the area of their screen or whatever. Uh, um, Rob, um, <coughs> so if I'm correct, what happens is the recording stays on the local machine. Mm -hmm. You can edit it on the local machine. You can't edit it in media library. No. Okay. No. Um, does it? Um, can it publish to Blackboard automatically after uploading? Yeah, so it would do. So in the case of uh, I'm a user coming in, I'm Rob, I'm a teacher, I come in, uh, selected media lecture, I've recorded my lecture. At the end of that process, in that category drop down, the first option is personal. And I will go into my personal category. Mm -hmm. When I go into Blackboard, I have all of the content that I've uploaded and my personal category. And I go into Blackboard and I just select that video and then it publishes it into Blackboard. Okay. Once it's published, does the local copy still retain? So, say I wanted to make additional changes. The local copy will still be there, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And would it be down to the user to clear it? It's a good question. I, <coughs> I've, do you think it's gone? I think there are, there are two options with that. If you upload it straight away, then, it, then I think it goes. If you save it, you can then make changes to it and then upload it, and it will keep that saved one there for you, so that mm -hmm. you can make further changes to that saved one. Mm. And then save it as a new one if you want, with those changes on it, not affecting the original, and then that's up to you to clear that down. Okay. We can't let it come into lecture rooms and use the equipment there, so it's not their problem to go back to it. And, you know, the best have their own <coughs> laptop thing there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they will be logging into media to use it, yeah. so it should be associated with their profile. Right. Yeah. To keep it for them. So it should be important to keep it there, because it's yeah. really important to. So, um, yeah. So that would work. But. Can you specify where you save it so you can save it onto a yeah. stick? Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's here, it's in settings, the storage, and you can just browse and select something different. You could, yeah. I mean, that file path <laughs> is just it's so long. I To find these files, because I wanted to do some testing on them to make sure they stream properly, and they're really buried away. They, they are quite... so. Yeah, if you're talking about just somebody putting a USB stick in and recording it locally, yeah, they could do that. It might be an easier way of doing it, potentially. Sorry, Rob, just yep. Sorry. Thank you. I just noticed a kind of an error. Um, the reason why is because on some desktops, the C drive is hidden away for most, um, most students. Yep. So what you're saying, it just wouldn't be... They wouldn't be able to search at it at all, yeah, because they can't navigate to the C drive. From what I know, this app installs without any admin rights at all. So the fact that it can do that, I would think whatever that directory is, is going to be one that's going to be accessible to the end user. Oh, so you can still click on browse, it'll open it yeah. up, and then you just right click. I've never been on a machine that I haven't been able to do that, but yeah. Okay. That's the, that's the user's local app directory folder, app data folder. So what we do at UCL, pretty much we 
everything we put onto um, our network share. So it's, we take massive amounts of stuff. So how big are the videos? Because what I'm thinking of is that if I have quite a few, that's all going to go over our, uh, that sort of synchronizes about profiles. It's and an hour is 200 megs, isn't it? 200 megs. I think it's 200 megs per hour okay. at 720p. I don't think the 1080p is barely any different. About two, yeah, 200 megs per hour. I mean, these files that I've got on my desktop are very, very small, um, but you know, they're only they're only tiny files at the end of the day. Let's get out of there. And yeah, like I say, it's on the Mac as well as the PC, so both. Where was I? I was. So I think I've mentioned this before. So the people that have got this uh, TechSmith relay thing, it's a slightly, uh, it, it's good news, but it's not as good as the, um, the media lecture way of doing it that's, that's quicker. That with relay, whereas before, um, what would happen is you would produce your content using relay. It would make a raw capture of the file. It would then uh, put it into 720p. It would then throw the file to us. And then we would do three different um, rates of that. Now, we don't really need to do that. We can just pass through what Relay gives us. The file will stream fine. And in V5, you'll be able to decide whether you want to do anything more than that. So this will speed up this process significantly. So if you already have Relay, V5 is going to be great for you because it's just going to speed this whole thing up immeasurably from what it, what it was before because it will be able to pass the file from Relay to us and we won't need to do anything with it whereas we, we did before. And then with medial lecture, the kind of the point I was making here is that all of the processing is done there on the local machine as they do it, and then it just effectively uploads it to medial. There isn't any transcoding to do on the medial side, unless you want more than one different quality, in which case you might want to do, I don't know, the logic we've been talking about with um, customers that are going to trial this is that we're saying if the content gets captured at 1080p, you might want to pass through the 1080p one and transcode to 720p. If it's done at 720p, you might just want to just do it at 720p or maybe a rate lower than that. Um, but realistically with this, I think you're just going to be transcoding once, only that, and that will cut the uh, transcoding time down significantly. Or you could do exactly what I did, do it at one rate and it will just be there immediately. So that's it for the V5 presentation. I'll do uh, my live demo now. <laughs>